So this is uh, beginning of a series of lectures on understanding software architecture. Um, and we're going to start with uh, what is actually software architecture. And our chapter on what is software architecture actually begins with this quote from Buckminster Fuller. Uh, we are called to be architects of the future, not its victims. So when I read this quote, I think about the relevance of this quote to software architecture, I think about the fact that, you know, we're trying to build uh, and design the future. We're designing systems for the future. We're designing things that are gonna exist in the future. And so of course, we want to have a successful design. We don't want our designs to fail in the future. We don't want to be the victims of the future changes. Instead, we want to build a system that can survive those future changes, no matter what happens in the future. So uh, this lecture is going to dive into a couple different topics. We'll talk about what software architecture is and what it isn't. We'll talk about uh, architecture structures and architecture views. We'll also talk about architecture patterns, and we'll talk about what makes a good architecture. So, you know, one of the things to think about when you think about software architecture is that because we're talking about it, you know, that, you know, basically there's a supposition there that software architecture is important to developing software systems and that there's enough knowledge and understanding about software architecture that we should, that we can talk about it. Um, and, and I think that's the case today. There's little controversy today that software architecture is important to developing software systems and that there is information out there that can be applied. Um, the basic principle of software architecture, you know, is that every software system is constructed to satisfy an organization's business goals and that the architecture of a system is essentially a road between those business goals and the final resulting system that'll help you to reach your goals. Uh, while the path from an abstract goal to a concrete system can be winding, uh, the good news is that software architectures can be designed, analyzed, and documented using known techniques that will support the achievement of business goals. Uh, the complexity can be tamed. We can have maps that show us how to get there. And so that's the goals that we're going to be talking about in the context of software architecture. Um, and in general, we're approaching this uh, from a software engineering perspective, but we'll also take uh, a look at perspectives from development, business, and organizations. So there are a lot of different definitions of software architecture in the industry. Um, you know, you could do a web search and so on. Uh, this definition is the one we're going to be using in our lectures. Uh, it's the software architecture of a system is a set of structures needed to reason or understand that system, which includes software elements, relationships among the software elements, and properties of both the software elements and the relationships. Um, you know, some of the other definitions that are out there talk about a system's early or major or important decisions uh, and so on. You know, however, you know, many architecture decisions are made early, but not all are. And many decisions that are made early are not necessarily architectural. Um, so, and it's hard to look at a decision to tell whether or not it's major or not. And so that's why we don't have early and major listed in that definition. Instead, we're focusing on architectural structures, which are pretty straightforward to identify in software. And they're a very useful tool for system design. So we're basically focusing in on this idea that architecture is a set of software structures. Um, now, a structure is a set of elements held together by a relationship. Uh, software systems, you can think of them as being composed of many structures. And that no single structure within that group of structures is the architecture. Instead, it's the association of all those structures that's the architecture. So structures can be grouped into several 
different categories. And the categories provide useful ways to think about the architecture. And so uh, we're going to focus on these three important categories of architecture structures throughout this series of lectures. We have module structures, component connector structures, and allocation structures. Um, basically, module structures are your design time structures, component connector, are your runtime structures, and allocation are relationships between software and non-software uh, components. Um, now, let's dive into this a little bit deeper. Uh, you know, some structures, partition systems, and implementation units, we'll call these the modules. Um, and the modules typically are going to have specific computational responsibilities and are the basis of work assignments for programming teams. In large projects, these elements are subdivided for assignment to sub teams. For our component connector structures, these are the structures that focus on the way the elements interact with each other at runtime. Um, and so we call these runtime structures component connector structures, or CNC. And a component, in this case, is a runtime entity. Um, you know, this could be a cloud service. It could be a software component running on a server, whatever. Uh, it's something executing at runtime. And so these services, the infrastructure they interact with, and the relationships between them is the, a structure that can be used to describe the system. Um, and of course, these runtime objects or cloud services or whatever they are, are compiled from the various design time components, the modules that we saw in the module structures. And then our third type of structure is the allocation structures. Allocation structures describe the mapping from software structures to the system's environments. So mapping software to the organization components, mapping the uh, software components to the install environment, the hardware, or the execution environment, the runtime, virtual machines. Um, so it's basically mapping software to some non-software item. So for example, if I have a software module for a banking system and I assign it to a particular development team, then that's a allocation mapping. I'm mapping the software component for this banking system to the specific person who's responsible for developing it. Um, similarly, if you're mapping your software to where the hard where it's going to be executing the hardware or the virtual machine and so on, that's again a mapping outside of the software environment. So a structure is architectural if it supports reasoning about the system and the system's properties. Uh, the reasoning or understanding should be about an attribute of the system that is important to some particular stakeholder. Uh, it can include things like functionality achieved by the system, availability of the system, if there's a fault, difficulty of making specific changes to the system, responsiveness of the system to user requests, and so on. Um, so if a stakeholder felt that uh, attribute is important, then that's something that, uh, you know, is architectural and that we should need to think about. But architecture is an abstraction, you know, uh, an architecture comprises software elements and how the elements relate to each other, but we are going to emit information that's not useful for understanding those relationships. So information that doesn't have ramifications outside of a single element, we're going to emit. Um, and part of this is so that we can see the, the entire forest as opposed to focusing on individual trees in the forest. So all the private details that are specific to a single tree, we don't care about. We care about the relationship among all the different trees. Um, and this arc abstraction is essential to taming the complexity of, of, of an architecture. We can't and don't want to deal with all of the complexity all of the time. But by abstracting away the details, we get a good look at the system in terms of its elements, the arrangements of the elements, and how they interact and how they relate. 
So every system has an architecture because every system has software elements and relationships between the software elements. However, it doesn't necessarily foul that that architecture is known to anyone. Perhaps all of the people who designed the system have moved on to other jobs. Maybe the documentation has been lost or was never created. Uh, maybe the source code has been lost or was um, never delivered to the customer. And all we have is the executing binary code. This reveals the difference between an architecture of a system and the representation of the architecture. The architecture of the system was created when they created that system, but the representation may never have been created. And so representations, which uh, we're gonna generally refer to as architecture documentation in this course, are extremely important because our, these, these representations or documentation is how people are gonna learn about that software architecture. Um, architectures include behavior. The behavior of each element is part of the architecture as that behavior can help you understand the system. The behavior of the elements embodies how those elements interact with each other and with the external environment. And this is part of our definition of architecture and has an effect on the properties of the system. Some aspects of behavior are below the uh, architect's levels of concern. Uh, but to the extent that an element's behavior influences the system as a whole, then the behavior is part of the system's architectural design and should be documented. So because architectural structures are at the heart of our definition of software architecture, we're going to dive into these concepts in a little more detail. And, you know, architectural structures have counterparts in nature. For example, if we think about physiological structures of the human body, the neurologist, the orthopedist, the hematologist, and the dermatologist all have different views of the various structures of the human body. You know, uh, furthermore, ophthalmologists, cardiologists, and podiatrists concentrate on specific subsystems. And then kinesiologists and psychiatrists are concerned with different aspects of the entire arrangement. Um, Although these views are pictured differently and have different properties, all are inherently related and interconnected. Together, they describe a single human body. So, you know, here, for example, we see our four diagrams of a human body. It's the same person, except the first one is showing you the skeletal uh, system. The second one is showing muscles. Uh, then we see the nervous system. And then we see uh, the blood vessels running throughout the body. And each one is essentially a different view on the same human body. And it's the same thing with architecture. Uh, we've, we've got these three types of structures we've been talking about. The module structure, which is design time view of the system, uh, of the software system. The con component connector, which is the runtime view of the system and how it executes so from a behavior perspective. And then you have the allocation view, which is how all of the systems are related between software and non-software. Um, and so again, it's just four different, in, in that case, it's three different views of the same software system, just like we have four different views of the same human body here. So a view is a representation of a coherent set of architectural elements as written by uh, the system stakeholders. So a view is a representation of a set of elements and the relationships among them. The structure is the actual set of elements. So the structure is what you actually build, but the view is a document that describes what you built. And so a view is a representation of a structure. So a module structure is, this, is the system's modules and how they're organized. And a module view is a representation of those modules and how they're organized. Architects then are designing structures but they're documenting the views of those structures. So the blueprint is the view, but the actual building is the structures that you built. So module structures, as we said, uh, embody decisions uh, as to how the system is to be structured as a set of code or data, whether that code or data is 
built or obtained in some way in any model st module structure. The elements are modules of some kind, perhaps classes or layers, or merely divisions of functionality, which are units of implementation. And modules are typically assigned areas of functional responsibility. There's less emphasis in these structures and how the software manifests at runtime, because that's the focus of the component connect structures and views. Module structures allow us to answer questions like, what is the functionality assigned to each module? What other software elements is that module going to interact with and depend on? And what are the relationships between uh, the different modules? Component and connector structures embody decisions to how, to how the system is to be structured as a set of elements that have runtime behavior. You know, components uh, are the elements and the relationships are the connectors. Elements are runtime components such as cloud services, uh, apps, clients, servers, and so on. Connectors are the communication vehicles, vehicles between those components, whether they're pipes or process flows or call and return and so on. And component connector views uh, enable us to answer questions like what are the major components? How are those components interacting at runtime? Uh, what, where are they storing data? How is data moving through the system? And so on. And so it's crucial for asking questions about runtime properties like performance, security, availability, and so on. Here is an example component connector structure uh, using an informal notation that's described in this particular key right here. Um, the system has a shared repository, this little account database here, that is accessed by a couple of servers up here, and as well as being accessed by an administrative component. Then uh, up here, we have a set of uh, banking tellers who can interact with the servers and communicate among themselves using this publish describe uh, connector that we describe here. Allocation structures show the relationships between the software elements and elements in one or more external environments in which the software is created and executed. Allocation views help us answer questions such as, where are these software components running? Um, where are these components stored in the hardware system or the file system? Wh which development teams have been assigned to develop which software elements and so on. Again, we're showing relationships between software components and the non-software environment, which these software components exist in. So structures play an important role in our perspective on software architecture because of the analytical and engineering power they hold. Uh, each structure provides perspective for reasoning about uh, the relevant quality attributes. Now, we're going to spend actually a lot of time talking about quality attributes later on this course, and we're going to divide des, des, and we will define them later. But um, quality attributes are things like performance, security, availability, usability, and so on. So, for example, the module structure, which embodies what modules use what other modules, is tied to the ease with which a system can be extended or contracted. The concurrency structure, which embodies parallelism with the system um, and is important for performance, is tied to the ease with which a system can be made free of deadlock and performance bottlenecks. The deployment structure is tied to the achievement of performance, availability, and security goals, and so on. So some useful uh, module structures. The first uh, useful module structure we'll take a look at is the decomposition structure. Uh, in the decomposition structure, the units are modules that are related to each other by the is a submodule of relationship. So decomposition is sort of divide and conquer. We'll have um, you know, one structure, we break it up into smaller structures and we break it up into smaller modules. So our structure is showing how the modules are decomposed into smaller modules recursively until the modules are small enough to be easily understood. Modules might have products associated with them, such as interface specifications, the software code, test components for the software code and so on. 
The decomposition structure determines to a large degree the system's modifiability by assuring that locally, likely changes are localized. Uh, by if you decompose it significant sufficiently, um, you can determine exactly how uh, modifiable the system is going to be. Uh, the decomposition structure is often used uh, for assigning code to be developed by the development projects organization. You know, once you divide it up into smaller and smaller components, and you then assign those small components to individual people or teams. And the units in this structure tend to have names that are organization specific, such as subsystems and so on. Another example of a module structure at design time is the uses structure. Uh, the units here are also modules in their classes if you're dealing with object oriented programming. Uh, the classes are related by the uses relationship, which is a type of dependency. Uh, I, one software component is using another if the correctness of the first requires the presence of a correctly functioning version of the other. Uh, the uses structure is used to engineer systems that can be extended to add functionality or from which useful subsets can be extracted. Uh, the ability to easily create a subset of a system allows for incremental development. Uh, here's a look at a uses structure. Uh, which is highlighting modules that have to be present in the increment if the module admin client is present. So if our admin client over here on the right is present, we need to have the admin core. And the admin core needs to have DAO and the util. So if we're adding admin core client, we got to also add these other three. Um, and this is a UML diagram. And we'll see a number of UML diagram or UM, unified modeling language diagrams in these lectures. A third example of a module structure is the layer structure. Uh, the, the modules in this type of structure are called layers. A layer is an abstract virtual machine that provides a cohesive set of services through a managed interface. Uh, layers are allowed to use other layers in a managed fashion. Um, in a strictly layered system, a layer is only allowed to use a single other layer but in a non-strictly layered system, they can do it, um, they can use other layers besides, a, besides, they're not restricted to a single other layer. This structure is going to add some portability to the system, and that gives you the ability to change the underlying computing platform easier. So let's take a look at an example layered structure. So here we see a layer uh, structure of the Unix uh, operating system. And so we can see uh, user programs on top of libraries and system call interfaces, the file subsystem, the process controller, down through the buffering mechanisms into the hardware control. And you can see by our key, which of these layers are the user level layer, which of these layers are kernel level layers for the Unix operating system. And our arrows are showing what you're allowed to use. So the user programs can't communicate directly to the hardware control. Instead, the user programs can only talk to the libraries or the system call interface. And the libraries can only talk to the system call interface. And so each arrow shows you who you can talk to um, or who your software component can talk to. Um, another example of a useful module structure is the class or generalization structure. This is typically used in object-oriented programming or analysis and design. Uh, the modules in this structure are called classes and they're related through inheritance, which is often referred to as inherits from or as an instance of. Uh, or is an instance of is where you take a class and create an object. Uh, this view supports reasoning about collections of similar behavior and capability. Um, the class structure allows one to understand software reuse and the incremental addition of functionality. If documentation exists for a project that has been followed an OOAD approach, it's in typically uh, this class or generalization structure. Uh, another example of a module structure is the data model. Uh, the data model describes static information in terms of data entities and their relationships, like an entity relationship to uh, ERD. Uh, for example, in a banking system, entities might be accounts, customers, and loans. Uh, 
Uh, account itself might have several attributes like account number, type of account, like savings or checking accounts. I uh, might have a status for the account and a uh, current balance for the account. A relationship may describe that one customer can have one or more accounts and one account might be associated with one or more customers. Here's an example of a data model showing uh, purchase orders, order items, and catalog items. And then we, down here, we have our, our, our legend. You can see the entities of the purchase order, the order item, and the catalog items. Uh, between the different entities, we show the relationships. Uh, so we, for example, if we look at the relationship between purchase orders and order items, uh, for each purchase order, there are zero or more order items. And for each catalog item, there are zero or more order items. Um, and then within the actual purchase order and the order item, the catalog items, we see a list of primary keys and foreign keys, and we see the actual um, attributes like client ID and shipping fold and so on, as well as the data types like integer or car or numeric and text and so on. All right, so those were all module structures which are focused on design time, whether we're talking about the data model or your class hierarchy and so on. Let's talk about runtime behavior. Let's take a look at component connector structures. Component connector structures show a runtime view of the system. Um, you know, and in these structures, um, all the modules we were talking about before are now in their executable code. And so we're just talking about what the executable code does. We're not talking about how the executable code was designed. Instead, we're talking about how the executable code is running uh, and you know executing. So the main relationship in a component connector structure is referred to as an attachment, uh, showing how the components uh, and the connectors are hooked together. Useful component connector structures include the service structure and a concurrency structure. In the service structure, the units are services, perhaps cloud services, that interoperate through a service coordination mechanism, such as certain messages. Uh, the service structure is an important structure to help engineer a system composed of components that may have been developed independently of each other. Uh, in a concurrency structure, the concurrency structure allows the architect to determine opportunities for parallelism and the location where resource contention may occur. The units are components and the connectors are the communication mechanisms. The components are arranged in logical threads. Uh, a logical thread is a sequence of computations that could be allocated to uh, separate threads later in the design process. The concurrency structure is used early in design process to identify and manage issues associated with concurrent execution. Some useful allocation structures include, uh, remember allocation structures are all about the relationship between software and non-software, whether software in the hardware, software in Teams, software in the file system, and so on. So our first one we'll take a look at is the deployment structure. The deployment structure shows how software is assigned to hardware. Uh, you know, the elements are software elements and hardware entities and various communication pathways. Relationships include things like allocated to, showing on which physical units the software elements have been allocated onto. Uh, this structure can be used to understand performance, data integrity, security, and availability. It's a particular interest in distributed systems and is a key structure involved in the achievement of deployability, which we'll talk about in a subsequent lecture. Here is an example of a deployment structure in unified modeling language where we see a uh, WebSphere application server, which is a Java uh, EE server that's deployed as an application server. Um, and it's basically serving up web pages or web applications to internet users, whether they're on a PC or a desktop. And on the back end, um, this web application is interacting with a database server. Some other examples 
of allocation structures include the implementation structure. This structure shows how software elements are mapped to the file structures in the systems development uh, environments. Uh, that's important for development activities. And we've got the work assignment structure. The structure assigns responsibility for implementing uh, the software modules to the teams that are carrying out those tasks. You know, the, identifying the individuals and teams that are supposed to develop particular components. Having a work assignment structure as part of the architecture makes it clear a decision about who does the work has architectural as well as management implications. The architect should know the expertise required in each team. Uh, later on, when we talk about microservices, we'll talk about the fact that in, with regards to microservices, individual microservices are usually designated to a specific team, and that has architectural implications. So each of these structures that we've talked about, the allocation structure, the component connector structure, and the module structure, are providing a different perspective and design perspective on the same system. And each view is valid in its own right. Um, although the structures give different perspectives, they are not independent. Elements of one structure are going to be related to elements of the other structures, and we need to understand those relationships. For example, a module in a decomposition structure can be manifested as one or part of one or several components in a component connector structure. In general, mappings between structures are not one to one. Instead, they're probably going to be many to many. So here's an example of two views of the same exact client server system. On the left hand side, we've got a module view showing a client and a server. On the right hand side, we've got a component connector runtime view showing um, the actual clients interacting with the server. Now, the first thing that, com that comes to mind when you view this is that in de design time, uh, we simply have a single client and a single server component. But at runtime, we have 10 clients uh, and one server. And this is because at runtime for performance reasons, we decided we wanted to have 10 copies of the same client code. Uh, but again, we only have one client code base over in, in the module uh, view. And so those 10 clients are all identical other than any specific parameters to you know, make them unique. Their code is primarily uh, practically identical. So you're going to hear a lot about design patterns in this course. Uh, architectural elements can be composed in ways that solve particular problems. And these compositions um, you know, may ha have value that can be used in multiple contexts. Um, and so when we come up with a solution to a problem and we see it's used in multiple contexts, um, you know, it might be a good candidate to create a design pattern. Um, and so when these composition solutions have been found useful over time and they've been documented, we call refer to these as architectural patterns. And you can think of a pattern as being a package strategy for solving problems that face architects. Um, and so architectural design patterns typically describe um, what the elements are and how they solve a particular problem. And so we'll talk about a number of different design patterns throughout these lectures. So one last comment about software architecture is that uh, what makes a good architecture? So really, there's no such thing as a good or a bad architecture. Instead, the question is, is, is the architecture more or less fit for your purpose? And you need to evaluate the architecture in the context of your goals. And you can think of this as sort of being like buying clothing. You know, if you go into a department store, 
not all the clothes in that store is going to be a good fit for you. Some of the clothes in the store are not going to be your size. Some of them will not be in your budget. Some of them will not uh, be the style you're looking for, the type of fabric you're looking for. It may not have the utility you're looking for. So you have to evaluate clothing uh, based on a number of different characteristics to determine if it's a good uh, purchase for you or not. And it's the same thing with architecture. Um, just like the clothes that you turn down at the department store might be very good for someone else. It's just not good for you. The same thing with architecture. Um, uh, you know, if there's several different architectures, one of them may be good for you. Others may not be good for you, but they may be good for someone else. So it's all going to depend on your specific goals. However, there are some general good rules of thumb to talk about uh, with regards to architecture. So first of all, um, ideally, you're going to avoid the problem of having too many cooks spoiling the broth. Instead, you should have a single architect or a small group of architects uh, who have a uh, technical leader come up with a consistent architecture. Um, you know, and this holds for all sorts of different types of architectures, whether we're dealing with agile, open source projects or traditional, it's good to have a, a single leader who's driving the architecture. And the architect or architecture team should base their architecture on their list of goals they wish to achieve. And we'll talk about this list of goals later on in these lectures in the context of quality attributes, like you're trying to achieve certain performance or availability or security requirements. And you want to document your architecture so that you know exactly what you're building and everyone has some understanding of what you're building. And so, uh, again, we're going to describe the architecture documentation by calling it architecture views. And these views, uh, because we're looking at different perspectives, whether we're talking runtime, design time, or allocation, uh, the views should focus on the concerns and goals you're attempting to achieve. So if you're attempting to achieve performance, then you should have views that are showing how you're gonna achieve the performance. And architecture should be evaluated based on whether or not the architecture is actually going to be able to achieve those quality attributes. Is it gonna be able to achieve the performance goals? Is it gonna be able to achieve the stakeholders availability goals and so on? Um, and finally, architecture should lend itself to an incremental implementation. Instead of working for many years and then having uh, and then turning the system on at the end of multiple years, instead you should be building small components all along and testing them and deploying them and incrementally adding in additional functionality over time. Uh, some other rules of thumb, the architecture should have well-defined modules whose functional responsibilities are assigned in the principles of separation and concerns. You know, for example, if we're creating a banking system and we've got a deposit functionality and withdrawal functionality, those will be separate. We're not going to intermingle the code. Um, and that way, if you need to update the deposit, you don't also have to update the withdrawal code. Um, and unless your requirements are, you know, uh, relatively uh, new, uh, you should be focused on, you know, achieving your quality attributes like performance and security using well-known design patterns. Um, your architecture should ideally won't depend on particular versions of products. Instead, you want to structure it so that changing and updating to new versions is straightforward and inexpensive. Um, and ideally, you want to make the system as modifiable as possible. So watch how uh, the components that produce data and consume data are related to each other. Um, another couple comments. Uh, again, we talked about the different views, like the module view for design time and component connector views at runtime. Again, don't expect a one-to-one -one correspondence between the module views and the component views. Um, and every process should be written so that you can easily move it, you know, don't tie it to specific hardware components, especially nowadays with cloud services. And the architecture should feature a small number of ways for components to interact. Uh, follow the keep it simple approach. You know, if you like messaging, then use messaging. If you want to use other approaches to communicate, then use those other approaches to communicate. But try and do the same thing the same way throughout your system. 
because that way everyone will know that we're always driving on the right side of the road if we're in the US or if we're in the UK, we know we're always driving on the left side of the road, uh, but don't you know change it from town to town. Uh, the architecture should contain a specific set of contention areas that you are focused on and, and that you know how to handle. Um, so in summary, the software architecture of a system is a set of structures needed to understand the system, which includes software elements, relationships between the software elements, and properties of the software elements and the relationships. And a structure is a set of elements and the relationships between those uh, elements. And then a view is a representation of a set of architectural elements and a view is a representation of one or more structures so when we're thinking about describing our software architecture uh we're talking about the structures but when we talk about our documentation describing the architecture we're really talking about the views so i want to thank everyone for listening to this brief in introductory lecture about what is software architecture uh there's gonna be a whole series of these lectures probably 20 or more diving into additional details of software architecture